Okay, so now let's discuss conceptual analysis. Um, a big uh, aspect of the approach that both uh, Thales and Stoke take in laying out their views online rests upon this approach that philosophers often adopt that's been described as conceptual analysis. So this is kind of a methodological approach that philosophers take in their research. And the basic idea behind this approach is that essentially what we're looking at oftentimes in philosophy is what actually are our concepts for different ideas that are of philosophical interests, right? So what do we mean, for example, when we say that someone knows something? What do we mean when we say the action was morally correct? What do we mean in the case of the readings that we're looking at for this week when we say that someone was lying, okay? So both of these readings for this week, uh, the, the assigned readings are arguing for different views, they differ from one another, about what it actually means to say that someone is a liar. And so when philosophers attempt to offer a conceptual analysis of some concept, and by the way, this is all, um, uh, many of these points are made at the beginning of Fallis's article when he lays out what his project is. But when philosophers attempt to offer a conceptual analysis of some philosophically interesting concept like knowledge or uh, moral uh, correctness or line, what they attempt to do is offer a series of conditions, okay? And these are supposed to be conditions that some instance has to meet in order to count as an instance of knowledge, an instance of, mor of moral action, an instance of lying, okay? So in conceptual analysis, we're first of all trying to offer some conditions for the appropriate application of that concept, when something will count as an instance of that, of that category. And now we might ask ourselves, well, how do we do that? How do we know that these conditions are correct? And the way in which the process of conceptual analysis works is essentially we attempt to offer some concepts or, or some, sorry, um, some conditions that capture instances of this particular concept. And then we imagine cases that meet those conditions, but perhaps don't satisfy the concept we're trying to investigate. Or else instances that do satisfy the concept, but don't meet those conditions. And so in those cases, we have reason to suppose that the conditions that have been put forward aren't an actually accurate conceptual analysis of the concept uh, that we're considering. So I'll give you an example. So for example, I might offer an account of knowledge, right? That rests on several concepts. So I say, I might say what it is for someone to know something is for them to believe that thing, for them to be justified in believing that thing, and for that thing they believe to actually be true. This is a very influential account of knowledge. It goes back to Plato. Um, it's been called the justified true belief account of knowledge or the JTB account of knowledge. And in recent years, there have been counterexamples to this account of knowledge, most notably by a philosopher named Edmund Gettier, who tried to devise cases that meet these conditions, but intuitively aren't instances in which someone knows something. Okay, so if we have a conceptual analysis in front of us and we wanna argue against that proposed conceptual analysis, we devise cases. Cases that either meet those conditions that have been proposed, yet intuitively the case is not an instance of whatever concept we're trying to analyze, or else we find examples of cases that are intuitively instances of whatever we're trying to identify, but don't satisfy the conditions that have been put forward. So if we can find cases of the first sort, cases that, um, that uh, meet the conditions, but don't intuitively count as what we're trying to analyze, then that will be reasons to think the conditions that have been put forward are too broad 
they include things that aren't instances of the category that we're attempting to analyze. And if we can find cases that the analysis leaves out but intuitively count as the thing that's trying to be analyzed, like knowledge, then those will, be, those will count as evidence that the analysis is too narrow. It leaves out some things that actually count. So you'll find with these articles that the authors are typically putting forward um, cases uh, in arguing against other of these theories, cases that either intuitively are instances of lying, but the theory that they're um, challenging doesn't count them as lying, or cases that intuitively are not count cases of lying, but the theory does count them as cases of lying. So in effect, in using the method of cases to test conceptual analysis, what we're doing is we're trying to come up with, we're trying to find cases um, that one, meet the conditions that are proposed in the conceptual analysis but which intuitively don't satisfy the concept. So like a case that meets the, the justified true belief conditions, but intuitively doesn't count as knowledge. And if we find those cases, then that will show that the analysis is too broad. It lets in things that aren't, for example, knowledge um, into, the, into the category. Or alternatively, we're trying to find items that do not meet the conditions that are proposed in the conceptual analysis, but are intuitively instances of the category. And if we can find those, then we will have shown that the analysis is too narrow because of some of its conditions, it rules out some cases that intuitively should be included under the concept of line, knowledge, moral action, or whatever we're trying to analyze, okay? So again, a conceptual analysis attempts to offer individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for a particular concept. What it means to say they're individually necessary means that each one of those conditions has to be met. And what it means to say they're jointly sufficient is that each, if each of those conditions are met, then the instance counts as an instance of the category we're analyzing. And we attempt to challenge conceptual analyses of a particular concept by identifying cases that either meet the criteria but don't count as an instance of the concept intuitively based upon our own judgments, or that do count as an instance of the, cat, of the concept, but don't, mat, don't meet the criteria that have been laid out. Okay, so that's a method that both Stoke and Fallis are using. Um, again, Fallis goes into this in some detail. You should read the Fallis piece first, um, but just bear that in mind, okay? Now, there are a variety of different accounts of lying that are discussed in these articles. I am going to tell you a little bit about how the method of conceptual analysis is used to challenge what we might describe as the traditional account of lying. And then I'm gonna say a word about 
how Stoke and Phallus offer accounts that are in some ways similar to one another, but are different from one another in certain respects that have to do with the theory of pragmatics that we developed in the first six weeks of this term. And then I'm gonna end by telling you a little bit about the article on bullshit by Harry Frankfurt. Okay, so the first case of uh, lying or the first account of lying that is considered by both uh, Stoke and Phallus is um, what we might describe as this traditional account of lying. It, it's put forward in the optional reading that you have for this week as well by um, Harry Frankfurt, um, but it actually goes back way further than Frankfurt. It goes back to, um, to uh, Augustine, uh, this uh, Roman philosopher, Roman Christian philosopher, who, um, who offered this theory as well. So according to Augustine, um, what it means for someone to lie, what, what is the case if someone is lying, is um, that they are saying something that they believe to be false with the intention to deceive. Okay, and we might think this intuitively is a pretty good theory of lying. Like someone is lying when they say something that they believe to be false with the intention to deceive. But in fact, both Phallus and Stalnacker, or sorry, Phallus and Stoke, point out counterexamples to this theory. I'm going to talk about some of the theory, some of the counterexamples that Phallus brings up for this theory. So again, some of these try to suggest that the theory is too broad, and again, that means it includes cases that intuitively are not instances of lying, but do satisfy the criteria that are put forward. And again, those criteria are um, that you lie if one, you say something, two, you believe that thing to be false, and three, you intend to deceive, to deceive by saying that thing, okay? So these are cases that meet those criteria, but intuitively are not cases of lying. That's, that, these are cases that suggest that that account of lying is too broad. So the first one involves um, false implicating, right? So imagine, um, uh, Faust has this imagine that he's at a party and an attractive woman comes up to him and says, um, what do you do, right? And so what he says in this case, this is, this is kind of a theme, he uses this case over and over a little bit, but in this particular instance of it, what he says is, I am the Prince of Denmark, okay? And we can imagine he says this in this very theatrical way, okay? Now, importantly, one of the most famous plays in the English tradition, Shakespeare's Hamlet, involves a Prince of Denmark. So we might think in this case, like if someone said this to you at this at a party, you probably wouldn't suppose that they are actually the Prince of Denmark. You would think they are like indicating to you in some way that they are an actor. Okay, and that's what Files is, is supposing here, right? So in this case, intuitively, um, Files thinks the person isn't lying with what they say because what they say is obviously not false, okay? So it doesn't have the intention to deceive there. But if Phallus is not an actor, but merely wants to make this woman believe that he's like cool in some way that philosophers aren't, then maybe he has further implicated this idea that he is an actor, right? And he wants her to believe that even though that's not true. Phallus is a philosopher, he's not an actor, okay? So, he has, in this case, said something false, right? Um, he has said something. He said something that he believes to be false. And he has said that thing with an intention to deceive, though not an intention to deceive with what he said, but with what is implicated by what he said, by the implicature that he's an actor. Phallus wants to say that this case does not count as lying. Intuitively, this is not a case of lying. It's a case of something else that we might describe as false implicating. He's definitely misleading this woman, but he's not misleading her by means of lying, Phallus thinks. He's misleading her by means of recognizing that she's gonna pick up on this implicature that is untrue, okay? So this case meets all of the criteria of the traditional analysis of lying, but it doesn't count as lying 
So that suggests that the traditional account fails. Now we might object to his example. We might think that it doesn't actually, that it is actually a case of a line, be that as it may. Um, Fallis employs another case to try and argue that um, the traditional account is too broad, that it allows in cases that aren't instances of line. And that case involves uh, an eavesdropper, deceiving an eavesdropper. So if you and I are talking about something, but we know that someone is eavesdropping who we want to mislead, we might speak falsely to one another, right? We might say things that we both know not to be true, right? Knowing what we're up to here. Um, of course, we don't deceive one another because we both know these things are false, but this eavesdropper who's overhearing us hears the things we're saying and comes to believe false things on that basis. So Fallis thinks this is a case of misleading someone again, but it's not a case of lying. You and I aren't lying to each other. We are misleading this third party in some way, right? But that does not count as lying in this case. It's misleading, but we don't want to count every instance of misleading as a lie, okay? So this would be a case where um, we say something, we say things we believe to be false, and we say those things with this intention to mislead this third person, but we aren't lying, okay? So both of these cases seem to show that this condition allows in, or this analysis, this traditional analysis, allows in cases that intuitively aren't instances of lying. Um, and so this analysis must be wrong, okay? Now you might attempt to fix this theory by saying, well, if you're lying, you actually have to intend to deceive with the thing that is said, and you actually have to intend to deceive the person you're speaking to. Fallis considers that, but still there are counterexamples that suggest that this account is, um, goes wrong. And these additional counterexamples are examples that Fallis thinks show that the traditional account is too narrow. So imagine the following case. Um, I might be a juror, or I might be a, a witness in a jury case. Um, I'm witnessing, I'm providing uh, expert testimony or I'm providing witness testimony against a crime boss, we'll call him Tony, okay? Now, it's come to my intention that if I end up incriminating Tony, this mob boss, he is gonna see to it that I am killed and my family is killed, right? So I don't want him to kill me and my family, of course. So what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm actually not gonna say the true things. I'm gonna lie in this case to the jurors, but I don't wanna deceive the jurors. I'd like Tony to be convicted very much so, right? So I am not intending to deceive the jurors. I hope that they see that I am not telling the truth. I um, have, maybe I have good reason to suspect that they will see why I'm, I'm saying these false things in this case, and they'll actually believe the opposite of what I say. So in this case, I am saying what I believe to be false, but not with the intention to deceive. So that condition isn't met. I don't have the intention to deceive. I, I want them to see through what I'm saying and know the truth. So from the traditional account of lying, I do not count as lying in this case. But Fallis thinks I am lying. And this shows that the traditional analysis, in addition to maybe being too broad, is also too narrow. It rules out some cases of lying that intuitively are cases of lying. Another example Fallis considers on this point has to do with bald face lies. Imagine a student who gets caught cheating they're brought to the Dean of Student Affairs or whatever. And this Dean is known to be a pushover. They will never punish a student unless the student themselves confesses to having cheated. Now, the student knows the evidence against them is countervailing, is like totally, is totally um, uh, convincing, shows that they have lied in this, or that they have cheated in this case. But nonetheless, the student knows this, repu rep uh, this reputation of the dean. So when the dean asks, did you cheat in this case? They say, no, I didn't cheat. I didn't cheat at all, right? They know the dean sees through them. They know the dean doesn't believe them. 
um, they know in fact that they cannot deceive the dean on this front, right? But intuitively they are still lying, right? They're telling a bald face lie here, a lie that anyone can see through, right? Um, so intuitively this person counts as a liar, even though they do not have the intention to deceive because they cannot deceive, right? So once again, it seems like the traditional account gives the wrong verdict. According to its conditions, this person doesn't count as a liar, but intuitively they are lying. So the theory gets it wrong. Okay, we can talk about those examples more. We can talk about the other counts that are put forward or discussed by Fallis and Stoke, but I wanna um, just say a word about their two views and what they have in common and the way in which they differ. So both Fallis and Stoke accept what we can describe as an assertion-based account of lying. So according to this account, S lies to A, A is the audience, S is the speaker, S lies to A, and so here we're talking about um, this point. So these are the assertion-based accounts in general. So these give the following analysis. They say S lies to A if and only if S asserts that P to A, and S believes that P is false. So that's what it is to, a lie, to lie. It's to assert something that you believe to be false. Okay, assert something to an audience you believe to be false. But now, as I said, both Fallis and Stoke accept this view, but where they differ is in what they think asserting is. Okay, so what is it to assert something? To assert something is in some way to give warrant to the truth of what you've said, but what does it actually amount to? And in fact, the way in which assertion is described by Fallis and Stoke is going to build on the theory of pragmatics that we developed in the first six weeks of this term. So Fallis's account of lying rests primarily on our Gricean notions of conversational maxims. You can see this account here. Um, it says two parts. So here's the asserting part. Lying includes these two conditions and an F3 for phallus three condition, which uh, somehow made it onto the other page here. So it's right there. Okay. So that bracket is meant to encompass all three um, statements. Okay. So what is it to assert? To assert is to state that P to A and to believe that Grice's first maxim of quantity is an effect, of quality is an effect. Okay, so that's according to uh, Phallus what it is to assert. To assert is to state that P to A and to believe that the first maxim of quality is an effect. Okay, if those two things hold, then you have asserted. And if you have asserted and you believe what you've asserted to be false, then you have lied. Okay, so Fallis spent some time defending why this is the appropriate view of asserting and why this gives us the right verdict for lying. Stokey again too accepts this general view of assertion, the assertion based account of lying that S lies to A if and only if S asserts that P to A and S believes that P is false. But he differs from Fallis in his account of asserting. Whereas Fallis develops his account against the general notions of maxims that Grice puts forward, Stoke develops his against the notions of common ground that Stallnacker puts, puts forward. So according to Fallis, S asserts something if S says that P to A and S proposes to make it common ground that P. I actually think that Fallis would be helped out here if he talked about common belief. And you'll see this come up a little bit in his distinction between official and unofficial common ground, okay? But basically what he's saying is that S, is, uh, S says that P to A and S proposes to make it common ground or common belief that P um, is what it is to assert something. And S lies if S does these two things and also believes P to be false. Okay. I leave it to you to look at how these two theorists argue that for the superior, superiority of their views. Again, it relies upon these kinds of example cases that supposedly show the thing is false. I've tried to summarize some of those cases in this chart here that may or may not be helpful to you. The X means, but it doesn't 
meet the case, okay? So the, 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 the particular count of line, which is over here, doesn't meet the case. And this is from Stokes' point of view. So this is a Stokes bias chart, and we can talk about counterexamples. In fact, I've provided some other counterexamples to Stokes down here at the bottom of the text. Okay, so these two accounts of line build upon different aspects of our theory of pragmatics that we've discussed so far. Um, on Grice's notion of the conversational maxims and on Stallnacker's notion of common ground. Um, the optional reading on Frankfurt, uh, the optional reading by Frankfurt on bullshit um, focuses on this kind of related phenomena to lying, which is not lying, but is bullshitting. And it too, um, in some way, relates to part of our theory of pragmatics that we've developed before, a different part. So what this third theory of bullshit says is that a bullshitter, unlike a liar, is not trying to misrepresent the truth of what is said. Instead, they're misrepresenting what they are up to, okay? So typically we might take people when they're asserting things to be trying to say things that are true, okay? What a bullshitter does is misrepresent whether they are concerned with the project of saying true things or not, right? So they pretend that they care about saying true things, but they actually don't. They care about saying things which are expedient to them. So you might think of some like powerful politicians of late who have you know, said things, um, not particularly caring if, if they're true or false, maybe they're happy if those things turned out to be true, but what's of supreme importance to them is the way in which it bolsters their own um, reputation, okay? Those politicians would be bullshitters, right? Because they don't actually care about the truth of what they're saying, they just care about its political expedience, okay? So bullshitting is a bit different. It has to do with what we're doing with words in a kind of Austinian sense, and it's misrepresenting what I am doing with my words. So have a look at that article too, if you're interested in that topic, and we can talk more about all three of these things this week. I look forward to talking with you. Have a nice uh, week. See you soon.